Hey everybody, this is Elon from Insight Fighting. I am going to keep it short. I had the privilege of training in one of the most obscure martial arts that I've ever seen. I went up to northern Portugal in the mountains and I uh, went to this village and it's a closed group. I was lucky enough to be invited by this individual, Pedro. If you saw my last video, as an amazing martial arts academy out here. Anyway, I want to talk all about it. I want to show you stuff from the system and what makes it unique. It is very unique. This is going to be a great video, so stay tuned. Watch till the end. I'm going to show a lot of cool stuff. All right, here we go. We're jumping in. We're going right now. Stay tuned. It's happening. Pow, pow. Inside, inside fighting. Yeah. Dangerous, dangerous martial arts. Pow, pow. Ooh, ah. Okay, so I pretty much met with Pedro very early in the morning. We end up going to this place about an hour and a half north of Porto. And it was one of the most unique experiences I've ever had. Now, Jogo de Pau, if you don't know, is a weapons-based system. Now, I like weapons. I'm a Filipino martial artist. I grew up doing stick fighting, knife fighting. And I know there's a lot of hatred of that. You can't ever fight with a knife. But the reality is these guys literally did train with staffs to defend themselves. Now, the interesting thing about Jogo de Pau is, number one, that it's very specific to where it developed. In other words, it developed in Portugal, but depending on where in Portugal you are, it developed differently. And Pedro said something very interesting to me that resonated throughout all of the martial arts. He said that the context creates the style. So based on what your needs are, the style will adapt. And Jogo de Pau could not be a more clear presentation of this. So if you go south more to Lisbon, you'll see that Jogo de Pau is more of a one-on-one -on -one dueling style. And as you go north, you find that it's more kind of group oriented. Now, one of the most unique things that I experienced out of this is that they train in a group in a sense of like a military formation and surround somebody and attack them. And that person has to either escape, get through them. Sometimes it might be two on, on three, whatever the thing is. But these formations are taken from old school military, you know, booklets or ideas. There's a connection there. And so I just want to jump in. I'm going to start showing some of these videos as I talk, because why waste time? At least let's have something cool on in the background. So here you see like one-on-one -on -one dueling. Now, they use these very long, heavy staffs. Now, these things, if they connect, feel like you're being hit with a truck. Like there's a difference between Rattan and this. This will not only put you in the hospital. Hey, there they go. They're in formation now. So there's three on one. This will not only put you in the hospital. This will take you out. Now, Every single place that I've seen, and there's not many, but I've been doing my research, trains differently when it comes to Jogo de Pau. So there's differences in the way they train. But if you see, this almost has like a military approach to it, old school military approach. Now, the style that I trained in, unfortunately, I videotaped and out of respect for them because they're a closed group. They asked me not to share it, so I will not be sharing it. The footage is cool as hell. But what they did allow me to do is talk about it. So this is not from my training, obviously, because this is from a long time ago and I didn't travel back in time. But uh, it was, you know, in some ways similar. So my training aside, what I found with Jogo de Pau is they have a tremendous kind of respect for the weapon. You have to take care of your own weapon. You have to sand your staff. They plant trees so that they'll have more wood in the future to build these staffs. And... Even just the way they care about the texture of the staff, the weight of the staff, they just have a great understanding of their weapon. And I love that. Now, the thing with where I trained it, it's this rural village. They had to learn how to protect their village. And if you think historically, this was a style that had to be either passed on from royalty to villagers as a way to protect themselves because they wouldn't give them swords and have a long time to train them. They would give them cheap weapons like staffs. Because there wouldn't be enough, you know, steel or bronze or whatever, you know, material was being used to make the weapon at the time. And this was something that was readily available that you could give to peasants. And so these villagers learned to develop and protect themselves based off of a more simplistic weapon. But it translates the motions to spear incredibly well and even very long swords. And uh, I think that that is the connection. At least that's how Pedro explained it to me. And, you know, it you look at this older footage here and it's, it's fascinating to see just how well they can manage range, how well they can manage timing. And when I went to the class, that was the first thing I noticed. I noticed just how well and how much emphasis they put on range because they have such a long weapon. This was new for me. Uh, I train with rattan sticks, which are not long or with a knife, which is even shorter. Uh, but going past like 90 centimeters as a, as a weapon into like this kind of range and 90 centimeters is long for a rattan stick changes things completely now 
I find that it is the only martial art I have ever trained that focused on multiple attackers in the way that it did. Now, multiple attackers is something that's unrealistic to fight against, but uh, it's also incredibly rare to see a style teach you to fight with other people against somebody, right? So really think about that. When you go learn karate, when you go learn kickboxing, when you go learn Kav Maga, whatever the self-defense is, they're not really taking into account that you probably will have friends with you a lot of the time when you're out in the open. Um, and so their entire argument is, you know, we're going to teach you how to defend yourself when you're alone. But how many martial arts have you seen that really teach you, hey, if you're with friends, why don't we teach you how to work as a unit to fight other people or surround somebody and tire somebody out and fight them individually to make sure you know how to do it? It's, it's something I never even considered as crazy as that sounds. I never was like, hey, there's five of us here training. Why don't three of us figure out tactics to fight you two? Why don't we come up with a plan? where we can work together. Why don't we train two against five so that the two of us are more efficient, God forbid something happens, if we do come across a mob of people who want to hurt us, that we already have a plan in place. And this is something that was a major part of Jogo de Pau where I trained it in this village because it had to develop this way. Again, they are villagers. And they even told me, I went out to eat with them after, have a drink. And they said, we're all together here right now. Because I asked them, why do you train as a unit? And they said, Exactly that. We're all together here right now. If someone came and started a problem with us, are you going to go fight him alone or are we all going to go fight him? I said, hopefully we're all going to go fight him. And I thought that was the most fascinating. It sounds so stupid, but it's such an epiphany for me. And it's it's something I literally, in my 27 years or more of martial arts training, have not even thought about. Like, that's ridiculous that I haven't even thought about that. Why don't I do that? And the more interesting thing with them is it's with weapons. It's with a staff, which is something you can actually carry with you. You don't need these super long staffs. But the style translates. Oh, I didn't realize how much I'm leaning back. I'm like, I'm slowly going to disappear on the camera, right? Like, I'm going to become this big from just moving further. By the end of this, I'm going to be all the way back there. Anyway, that was a weird little transition. My fundamental point is uh, that for me was a huge, huge uh, realization, epiphany, a great moment. This was one of the most unique martial arts experiences I've ever had. Now, I'll say this. I'm I'm hoping, and I'm going to put more video on in the background so we can talk about it. I'm hoping that they eventually do trust me enough to let me show some more stuff. So this is interesting. You see how the sticks are shorter here? Again, context determines the art. And Pedro explains to me, he said, you'll see sometimes Jogo de Pau with like these 70 to 90 centimeter sticks because they had to develop that way because they were traveling and they couldn't fit a whole staff in the car. Now, this is I'm going to play this again because I think it's awesome. This is very akin to Filipino martial arts, but a long-range Filipino martial arts system. You would not see this in Dosya Paris. You would not see this in Balintawak. You would not see this in a lot of... Even, even like a Pekiti Tirsa would not move like this. You see this in maybe closer to like an Illustrissimo, which really, really focuses on that long range. But it's almost like fencing. This reminds me more of fencing. And um, so... They took Jogo de Pau, depending where you are in Portugal, and developed it completely different. Different in the following ways. In Lisbon, you'll find that there's more corridors, narrow alleys, and there are more in a city. So they traveled more alone. So what they developed is a more one-on-one -on -one dueling system. And in many cases, like you just saw, with shorter sticks. Now you go north, you go to these villages, what you find is a camaraderie-based martial art it uses very long, heavy staffs that work in a unit. And all their drills, all of them, they do dueling, 10% dueling, 90% group fighting. And the way they explained it to me was, or Pedro explained it to me, said if a, if a hyenas, if a group of hyenas want to take an animal out, what do they do? Do they just go and attack it? Or will they surround it and picket it and tire it out and freak it out so that it gets tired while they don't have to expend so much energy? And then they can go kill it. Now, look, the truth is, I don't, I don't know if hyenas do that or don't do that. I just think it's a brilliant anecdote. I'm going to be using words that I don't even know if they're correct. Regardless, I do think it's kind of a brilliant analogy to fighting. And uh, again, that was another realization for me. You don't always have to go for the kill. If you have the upper hand, you can tire someone out, especially with a weapon. So the mentality of the weapon changes things tremendously. Um, because in Filipino martial arts, again, I'm we attack the hand and they do that in Jogo de Pau too, but I've never, my teacher's never been like, stay at range and get them tired if there's more than one of you. Uh, and so you'll see here, these are the dueling ways to fight. 
man, this style is fast and it is scary. It's hard to capture what it's actually like when you're not there because when you're holding that heavy stick and there's one whipping by your head, man, it changes things. A lifetime of Filipino martial arts did not prepare me for this. And I'm going to show more formation stuff right now. So you see they're actually fighting in formation. They're fighting with shorter sticks. Uh, you know, these short sticks, you can do single-handed stuff. But with the big sticks, it just has to be double-handed. And here you really see that. It kind of is captured here. And this is more akin to what I saw in northern Portugal. Right? You have to keep people away and you have to get yourself out. And what I loved also about what they did, and this is something I talk about. Man, I, I have so much good stuff to say. What, what I loved about it was that they get into it. They play it out. They'll start screaming in Portuguese, let me pass, let me pass. And the other people will start picking at you and pissing you off. And then out of nowhere, it'll break out into a fight and they'll start swinging at each other's heads and like trying to take each other's heads off. And I mean, it's just such a cool kind of alive environment. Now, they they do also spar with some protective gear. In the place I trained, as you can see here, this is not where I trained. Uh, they don't do this as much because it could develop bad habits. You could stop respecting the danger of the staff when you wear protective gear and you put foam on it. Uh, the unfortunate reality of a staff, and this is like the great contradiction of martial arts, this is the, the great question, is that the more protective gear on, the more alive you can make it. But the more alive you can make it, the more sometimes unrealistic you make it. And what I mean by that is they've now padded the sticks and they've protected their head. So they lose respect for the danger of just getting hit in the hand or getting hit in the body or getting hit in the head, especially with a weighted heavy long range staff and so sometimes you develop counterproductive habits in this the perfect example of this is wekaf in filipino martial arts and if you look at wekaf uh what you'll see is that sorry for the beat that just happened that's my computer if you look at wekaf what you'll see is that these guys are just in close range and they're going like duck, 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 and whacking each other with the stick and no one's really moving back no one's really using footwork in the in the truest sense of the word like they should because there's no real danger. The next step up from that, I've talked about this before, is Dog Brothers because they're actually using a real rattan stick and they're wearing protective headgear and hand gear. And what did that develop? It, it developed a style where people didn't like getting hit. So they rush in. What they, what they miss with that is that the headgear became a tool. It became a weapon because you could just absorb a shot on the head and get close and clinch somebody. It still created some degree of unrealistic response. And anytime you offer protection, anytime you take away or add a rule, I can't kick you in the groin, I can't hit you in the eye, you obviously create some degree of unrealistic response. There's a compromise. I know this is going to piss a lot of people off. Listen, I'm a combat sports athlete. I love Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I've been doing it my whole life. I'm just going to re-mention this. 25 years of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I've done sambo for a, for a big part of my life when I was younger. I've done Muay Thai, Kyokushin. Filipino martial arts with comp, with actual full, full force stick fighting. So I understand the importance of sparring. I think it's absolutely necessary, but I also understand it's a compromise. And so I also try and be aware of the reality-based aspects. Now, Jogo de Pau seemed like it was very reality-based. Now, here's what you would see in Lisbon in an alleyway. They don't have as much space. And you can see there's kind of two people walking with a staff. And you see, they, they play it out. All these people play it out. I love that. Um, now, it might look choreographed. Look, I don't know if this exact exchange is choreographed, but I know the ones that I trained at, the, the place where I trained, was not choreographed, and it looked more crazy and fluid than this even. It was just extremely explosive, and they would just trade strikes with each other. And people got hurt. I mean, there's a history of people having injuries there. And it's like, you can't take the stick for granted. So, look, I just really wanted to share this amazing... That was sick. I really just wanted to share this amazing style with you. I had such a good experience. I'm really hoping that down the road they open it up. Let me shoot a whole video with them. Let me show you what they do. Uh, and I think they will. It's probably going to be in about half a year from now, so stay tuned for that. But this completely kind of opened my eyes up to the following things. And so I just want to reiterate the points because we got to see some cool footage. Again, hard to understand from the footage just how cool this system is. But let's just go over what we learned. What we learned is, or I learned, hopefully you guys learned, is that I'm going to start being more aware and implementing training in groups. I think it's super, super cool. 
And again, not training against multiple people, because that's something we're all aware of, but training with multiple people to take out other people. Um, I understand it from a military's perspective, you know, like, you, you know, clearing drills and all that stuff, but I've never thought about it empty hand or with sticks, just never thought about it. Here's another thing. I'm going to look at really taking more seriously carrying a baton around with me. Now, this is weird because I do carry a firearm in the United States when I'm there. I think mace is a great weapon. And I'm actually going to give a rant on self-defense weapons. So I've seen this in my own comment section. I've seen this in numerous comment sections of self-defense. I'm just going to use my gun. If someone starts with me, I'll just shoot them. It seems like it's like the go-to answer for people, some people who like guns or want a posture that they can do self-defense and they don't need to because they have a firearm. The reality is there's numerous situations where you do not want to shoot somebody. Shooting someone is, number one, not as easy as people think. Number two is not always the viable option. And number three comes with a myriad of legal ramifications and ethical ones. You know, like if someone pushes me, I don't want to pull up my gun and shoot him in the chest. And so um, I think that I personally know I don't want to have to figure out in a high stress situation, is this the right option? In other words, do I want to go from zero to full escalation of killing somebody right away? There should be other options along the way. Now, mace is a wonderful option because it causes no long-term permanent damage. It has decent range, and it's very, very effective. So it covers all the bases of what you would want. The only danger with mace is that if someone is already close range on you and caught you off guard, it's very hard to use, very, very in tight. You're going to get it on yourself. It can still work, but you're going to take some of that in your face, and it's going to be very overwhelming. Uh, but it's something you don't need to hesitate to use like a firearm. Now, a baton is kind of in the middle of those two things. And it's something that I would learn how to use very efficiently. I'm already efficient. I do Filipino martial arts. But even more, I felt like I felt like Jogo de Pau would give me another layer onto my, my weapon fighting that I just don't have. And so um, a baton is, a, and I, I do have a baton, is a great weapon. It's a very underrated weapon. Because it can allow you to stay at range against other weapons, especially if you have mace. You mace the guy, you hit him in the hand with your baton, he's going to drop his knife. You know, you hit him in the kneecap. Yeah, you'll mess him up. Yeah, it's very, very rough. But it's not shooting him in the face, and it's a, it's a far less lethal option. I wouldn't hesitate to do that comparatively to shooting somebody. And again, because I'm trained with my baton, because I'm very effective with my baton, it's far less likely to be used against me in a real confrontation than a firearm. Right, because you better hope in close range that when someone's already attacking you, you can draw and use your firearm and be effective with it before the other guy takes it and shoots you in the face. You have to know how to use a baton to some degree to be very effective with it. And so that was just something that this reiterated for me. I'm, I'm a huge fan of weapons that are not lethal and I'm a huge fan of weapons that I don't need to hesitate to use. Um, what else did it reiterate for me? Uh, just my passion for obscure, weird martial arts, man. They're so cool. There's all these weird systems out there that developed because of historical needs that like nobody talks about. Nobody cares about them. Nobody really looks into them. I mean, there are people looking into them. There, I found, you know, some great documentaries. And Pedro did great documentaries on Jogo de Pau. If you guys want to see them, I'll send them to you. Um, but there's just so much of this. There's such history here. And the history aspect of martial arts is often disregarded in place of, is it efficient and can I use it in a ring? And not everything is about that for me anymore. I really, really had a good time. So I just want to say thank you to the guys who allowed me to train with them. And I can't wait to train more in this system. This is a system I will be training when I'm here. So if you like this video, I, I look, I hope I introduced you to something cool that you haven't seen before. Jogo de Pau, not bread, game of the sticks, not game of, not game of, of bread. And uh, yeah, like and subscribe, share the video. Thanks, guys.